Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about work done by friction. Now, usually we would say that the work done by friction is equal to a decrease of kinetic energy, meaning that after an object has come to rest, the force of friction does not suddenly then speed the object up in the other direction, kind of like the force of gravity would do. So because of this, we call it a non-conservative force. And instead of saying that we just lose that energy completely, as in it's just gone, we would instead say that we have gained an amount of heat or thermal energy. The idea simply being that friction causes a loss of kinetic energy, but that loss of kinetic energy is not an absolute loss of energy. It's not like that energy is gone from the universe. Instead, it has been turned into what we call heat energy, and then will eventually kind of dissipate or cool off um, as it heats up and equalizes with all the things around it. This change of energy is useful for us because we know that the work done by friction is always equal to the force of friction times the distance. And usually when I write delta E T T H E T T H E T H T H oh my god. Um, you could write it the heat at the end minus the heat in the beginning. Usually I'll just pretend that there's no heat in the beginning. And so instead of writing delta E T H, I'll just write ETH and use it sort of as an energy analysis tool. Um, and then the other thing that we can do with friction is replace it with mu times the normal force. So mu times normal force times distance, that's going to tell us the amount of energy that we lost, but not because it's completely gone. Instead, it's kinetic energy that we lost that has been turned into heat. This makes sense because if you put your hands together and make friction, you'll heat up your hand. Also, this is why work was so interesting to people working in the Industrial Revolution. Um, they wanted to, to, you know, try and analyze their steam engines and machines that were generating a lot of heat. On the AP test, this equation is not present, so you're going to want to make sure that you somehow cleverly remember this. All right, well, here is a classy little example. Let's say you push a 10 kilogram, oops, sorry, 10 kilogram box giving it an initial velocity of 5 meters per second. It slides across the floor and comes to a stop after moving 2 meters. How much heat was generated? Okay, well, in this case, box moves across the floor. It's got an initial velocity. And eventually, it comes to a stop. So at the end, you would have no kinetic energy because it's not moving. At the beginning, you would have some initial kinetic energy that's equal to half the mass, so half of 10 kilograms, times the velocity, 5 meters per second squared, which 5 times 5 is 25, times half of 10 is 25 times 5, or 125 joules of energy. OK, so that would tell me that the change of kinetic energy, delta K, is 125 to 0, so I lose 125 joules of energy. But again, that energy isn't actually lost. Instead, it is energy that is gained. And we would say that that energy comes from the force of friction. So if it asks you to find heat, and it gives you the amount of the information you need to find kinetic energy, it's really easy to solve the problem. Let's do another one. Rod Kimball travels over the top of a hill on his moped. Four meters a second, the hill is 10 meters tall. At the bottom of the hill, it is 10 meters per second. How much work was done by friction? All right, so this is a tricky problem. Let's draw ourselves a little here. Hill. Okay, here is, we don't need a ramp. Here's the hill. Okay, so here's Rod. We'll model Rod uh, with a little tiny bike. It's gonna be fantastic. Oh my God, he's having so much fun. He can't wait to go down this hill. Yay! Okay, so initially, Rod has a velocity. That means there is a kinetic energy in the beginning. Um, and he is at a height of 10 meters, so there's going to be some Yu-Gi-Oh there as well. At the bottom of the hill, 
he will only have potential energy due to gravity. Um, but what you'll find is that if you solve this problem and figure out, I'm sorry, he won't have potential energy. He'll have kinetic. Sorry. And what you'll find is that if you solve this problem and figure out what the kinetic energy is at the end and get a velocity, it's actually going to be higher than 10 meters per second. That means that there was friction. So here's what I would write at the end. There is ETH, friction. Then when I write my energy equation, my conservation, E not equals E, I know that in the beginning I have kinetic energy, potential energy due to gravity, and at the end I have kinetic energy and this little bit of heat that has been generated. You might wonder to yourself, how am I going to figure out what this amount of energy is? Well, all I need to do is subtract K from both sides, and I will figure out what the answer to this question is, what the work done by friction will be. So the work done by friction is simply just this missing energy, this heat that's created at the end. So my initial energy would be half of the mass times 4 meters per second squared. The potential energy in the beginning is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, which we'll use 10, times a height of 10 meters. And then I'll take away that final kinetic energy, which will be half of 70 kilograms times 10 meters per second, the whole thing squared. And what we are going to find is, looks like 4,060 joules of missing energy. So that is the heat that is created. So basically we just sort of tack it on at the end to try and figure out what that energy would be that's missing. All right, let's do another problem. A giant taco slides across a rough surface with a coefficient of friction of 0.2. If the taco was initially traveling 4 meters a second, how far does it go before coming to a stop? Oh, this is a great one. So draw her yourself a merry little taco. Oh, fantastic. Can't you wait? I can't wait till the AP test is over and it's just tacos all day. Oh man, it's going to be great. So here's a giant taco. And initially, it is traveling at 4 meters per second. And if I was to draw a free body diagram, mg, the normal force, friction, acts back on the taco. Now that doesn't mean the taco moves to the left, it's just that as the taco slides, there is going to be a force of friction acting back on it until its velocity is zero. And again, weight force, normal force, I don't really need to draw them here, but why not? They are equal. Okay, so here's the idea. In the beginning of this problem, I would say that there is kinetic energy and at the end, all of that kinetic energy will have been turned into heat. So when I write my E naught equals E equation, I would say in the beginning I have kinetic energy, at the end I have heat, because all that kinetic energy has been turned into heat. Now I plug in my equation for kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, and my equation for heat, which is friction times the distance traveled, because the heat is equal to the work done by that force of friction. You might be thinking to yourself, I don't know the mass of this taco. That's okay, it's muy mas. Anyway, here's what we would do to solve that. You know that the force of friction is mu times the normal force, and the normal force is equal to the weight. So instead of writing FD, I can write mu mg times d. And if I do that, the mass cancels out. And I'll rewrite this as v squared over 2 equals mu g d. And if I want to find d, I just need to divide both sides by mu times g, which would be v squared over 2 mu g. When I plug in my numbers, 4 meters a second. Or sorry, I should write this as v naught, v naught, v naught. 4 meters per second over 2 times mu is 0.2, 
and g is 10 meters per second squared. So this is going to give you a distance of um, 4 meters. Great, let's do another one. Your phone is stupid, so you kick it up a hill. The hill goes up with a constant angle of 30 degrees, and the coefficient of friction between the hill and your phone is 0.4. Let's draw this for a second. Here is your stupid phone. It's going up a hill with a constant angle. That means that it's not a curving hill. It's just like a regular inclined plane where that theta is 30 degrees. I can write that somewhere if I want. And you know that it travels 4 meters in a straight line up the hill. That's trying to tell you the distance d that it travels. So you know it goes 4 meters up the hill. Here it comes to a stop. Down here, the initial velocity is... Oh, that's what we're going to find. Question mark, okay. So anyway, if the phone travels 4 meters in a straight line up the hill, I skipped that part, um, you want to find the initial velocity that you kicked it with. Here's how you solve this problem. In the beginning, you would have all kinetic energy. So let's write E naught equals E. In the beginning, you would have all kinetic energy. At the end, when the object comes to a stop, you would have gravitational potential energy because it is raised a certain height. But now, there will also be some friction. So you write plus E T H. Now, the initial kinetic energy is easy, one half the mass times the initial velocity squared. The potential that it has is pretty easy. It would be mg uh, y. And to figure out what y is, say y not equals 0, basically, you would take the angle. And here we can call this y. Um, you basically take the angle theta and d as the hypotenuse, and it would just be d sine theta. If that doesn't make sense to you, think about it for one minute, like pause the video and find it. It's just, we're just using a right triangle, you know, sine. Um, so instead of saying y, I could write d sine theta. All right, so that's my ug. And now the thermal energy, I would write this, I would say friction times the distance. Now, we don't know the mass of your phone because it is stupid. If I can somehow express friction in terms of the mass of your phone, though, then I can cancel it out because it's in every term. So here's what I would do to do that. I know the weight force is down, mg. The normal force is out. Now, when I turn this into components, I'll get mg sine theta going down the ramp and mg cosine theta going into the ramp. The normal force would be equal to mg cosine theta, where theta on my little triangle goes here. So I can write friction as mu times the normal force, which is mu times mg cosine theta. Now I can rewrite friction times distance as mu mg cosine theta, and I have an m. In every term. Now this is still a really messy equation. B naught squared over 2 equals, sorry not m, but g d sine theta plus mu g cosine theta. But if I want to find the velocity, it's as simple as taking this whole thing and multiplying it by 2. Then square rooting it. So the square root of 2 times 10 meters a second squared. The distance is 4 meters. Sine of 30 degrees plus the coefficient is 0.4. And g is 10. Oh man, running out of room. Cosine 30 degrees, which is going to be awful to put in your calculator. Uh, but when all is said and done, you should get Let's say 6.85 meters per second. Or you can say 6.9. This is definitely a little bit more difficult, um, but 
the key was being able to write the force of friction with the normal forces mg cosine theta and we would only be able to do that because we're told that the hill goes up with a constant angle of 30 degrees. If this was like a curving roller coaster loop, then you would need to know the, um, well, you just wouldn't be able to do this. So you would do something completely different. Anyway, no more problems. You did it. Congratulations. I hope that you win big on tomorrow's spin. Thanks and bye-bye.